Today's lecture is patent prosecution and disclosure requirements. We're going to cover several things in this lecture. First, the architecture of the patent system. Second, patent theory. Third, patent prosecution. And then the two requirements for disclosure, enablement and written description. So let's begin with the architecture of the patent system. The basic setup of the uh, patent system to understand is that it, it is policed by, well not really policed, but it involves a major administrative agency, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They also do trademarks, but for purposes here uh, we're just talking about the patent side. Um, and their job is to evaluate patent applications for compliance with standards of patentability. If you want to get a patent in the United States, you have to apply uh, to the USPTO for that patent. The patent document is critical to everything. Everything that, that is uh, important about a patent uh, can be found uh, in the patent document. Uh, the document establishes the boundaries of the protections through the patent claims which are in that document. It discloses what the invention is and how it relates to other inventions including the prior art. Um, the disclosure is required. There's a number of dates and timing and other aspects that we'll talk about in a moment that are also uh, on the patent document. So the patent document is critical. It's sort of the end stage of, it's the work product or end stage of the administrative body. The, the uh, uh, PTO will issue a patent uh, document uh, when it grants a patent. And finally, the third part of this is the aspect, uh, which is that it's private enforcement of patents. Nobody's going to enforce your patent for you. Uh, patents are a hunting license, not an automatic reward. The market determines reward. How much money your patent makes is determined by how you enforce it or license it in the backdrop of enf with enforcement being in the background. Uh, during litigation, importantly, uh, for the patent system, there's a full review of the PTO grant. Uh, which means that uh, as a practical matter um, when you litigate for patents you are not only determining whether you've infringed that patent but you are also determining whether that patent is valid under the standards for patentability and although though the PTO has by definition if it's a granted patent already evaluated patentability um, that is uh, under full review during the litigation stage. So let's talk briefly about the patent document. Um, the patent document, the front page of the patent document is critically important. It includes a title and a serial number. Every patent has a title. Every patent has a number. Uh, the numbers are, of course, unique and they're just serial. Um, each, each one, there's no particular uh, uh, subject matter aspect to the patent number. They're just added to the end. Um, the dates are important. The date the patent is issued is at the top, the date of the patent. Uh, the filing date is found along the left column. Uh, you can also, by digging further into here, uh, find a priority date uh, as well. The cover of the patent also includes the inventor, uh, the name of the inventor or inventors. Patents can be invented by more than one people working together, more than one person working together. Um, and patents can be assigned, when, and if you are the assignee of a patent, you are the owner of a patent, functionally the owner. By, by default, inventors are, of course, the owners of the patents. Uh, if you file formal documentation with uh, the patent office, uh, you can assign your patent to anybody. Uh, and happens in many cases in employee-related uh, inventions, um, but by default, inventors are the, also the owners of the patents. Uh, every patent is classified according to various technology fields. The PTO has an entire division of the patent office that is um, dedicated to doing this. Uh, and so this is uh, found on the cover. Uh, they all have uh, letters and number designations uh, for the different technologies. This aids primarily in searching uh, for prior art. So if the PTO is, is looking for um, other relevant prior art uh, information, uh, related to your invention, they can look in a similar class of, um, uh, in, of technologies in order to find the, the right information. Uh, references cited, again this is useful for searching, uh, it's useful for fully understanding the patent. Um, you get to see what uh, was cited during the patent uh, examination stage. 
Uh, and then there's an abstract. The abstract here is uh, intended to be a brief description of what the invention actually is. Um, most patent applicants write abstracts in, in a rather broad manner so as to attract more attention, uh, maybe get people to think that their patent uh, covers more than it actually does. So abstracts are not the measure of the invention, but they are supposed to be uh, directed to um, uh, information that, that generally covers what the invention is. Throughout the rest of the patent document, there are sections that include the drawings. Every patent should have drawings if they are, are is required actually to have drawings if they are useful to the disclosure. Uh, the specification is the uh, textual part of the patent. Um, and then the claims are at the end. The claims are at the very end of the patent. Um, and in patents, really, uh, you know, the, the famous phrase that comes from a court case uh, is that the name of the game is the claims. Right, so you can see here on the right a set of claims for the patent document that I was uh, looking, uh, pointing out earlier. Um, a vehicle, what is claimed is one, a vehicle for carrying a payload, the vehicle comprising a platform uh, which supports a user, a ground contacting module, and so forth. Um, the, the rules for claims is that they must particularly point out and distinctly claim the invention. Claims are the metric, uh, the measure, uh, and the definition of what the invention is. The rest of the patent is not uh, supposed to be more than just a general description. It's the claims that really determine what the patent, what the invention that's at hand actually is. So the claims don't have to tell you anything about how to make or use the invention. They just have to tell you what the invention is. Um, they, they don't have to be very detailed. Um, they have to be, we'll talk, you know, throughout our section on patent law about how you decide how detailed to make your claims, right? The more detailed you make your claims, the narrower your patent claims are, right? The less subject matter they cover. Uh, that has a big advantage uh, in the sense that you will then encompass less prior art. Um, meaning there'll be fewer prior art references that can be used against you to try and invalidate your patent. It'll also make it easier to disclose the amount of information you need to in order to have a valid patent. On the other hand, the narrower your patent claims are, um, the less enforcement scope you're going to have. You're not going to be able to cover as many things uh, as you would if you had a broader patent. Right? And so one of the things to understand right from the outset is that patent claim drafting, and indeed entire patent drafting, but especially the claims, um, is extremely strategic. Right? Patentees are in charge of claim drafting and they have very specific uh, goals in mind. Right? They want to, at the same time, draw their patent claims as broadly as they possibly can because that maximizes the economic reward that they're going to get from the patent. And yet, they don't want to be too broad because if they're too broad, their patent is invalid. And so it's all about walking this line between being broad but not too broad as far as the patentees are concerned. Now, the public, on the other hand, is going to have a different uh, goal for, patents, uh, for patent claims. And for the public, I think the primary objective is to have patent claims to be as clear as possible. The reason for that is that one of the most important features of a patent claim is not only to tell you what is claimed, what the invention is, what's protected by the patent, but also to explain what is not. Right? So if you are a competitor of somebody who has a patent, you need to know not only what your competitor's patent covers, but even more importantly, what it doesn't cover so that you can compete in that space. So from the public's perspective, what we probably care about most in the patent claiming context is that the claims be clear, right? So they be understood that there it's possible to understand what they mean um, uh, with some sense of certainty, right? Note that that is not necessarily at all what the patentees are interested in, right? And in fact, you can argue that patentees are interested in precisely the opposite, right? From the patentee's perspective, your best bet might be to have claims that are susceptible to many different interpretations and understandings, right? So for example, if you had a vague claim, you could argue to the patent office that the claim was relatively narrow, right? That it didn't cover certain pieces of prior art, that it didn't have particular disclosure problems. And later on, you could then argue once it was issued, 
right, five, ten years later, whenever you litigated it, you could argue that it was much broader, right, that indeed it did cover a whole range of technologies that maybe didn't seem uh, like it would at the time that it was, it was filed for. So that's why we often talk about patent claims in terms of the incentives being misaligned, right? The patentee's incentives are not the same as the public's incentive with respect to claim, uh, claim interpretation, claim drafting, and that uh, leads to, I think, a lot of problems with the patent system. So an overview of the life of the patent, right? So you have an invention. An invention is created by one or more real persons. Um, they create this invention. They decide it's patentable. They apply for a patent. There's a phase here uh, during prosecution where it's uh, filed with the patent office. Uh, right now that's around 30 to 35 months uh, of, of, uh, of prosecution time. Uh, this is the back and forth between the patentee, the patent applicant, and the examiner about whether or not the patent, uh, the invention meets the standards for patentability. Um, the patent will eventually issue. Uh, most patents applications do issue, not always in the same form as, as they started, um, but statistics show that somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of patents end up issuing, um, uh, patent applications end up issuing. And then once a patent is granted, once it's issued, it gets published, the number gets published in the Federal Register, the patent document becomes available on the patent website and as well as in public libraries and so forth, um, and you can enforce it, right? Once a patent is granted, you can file a lawsuit in any federal court in the country claiming patent infringement. So that starts the enforcement phase. So the patent term is 20 years from the date of application, which you can understand means that you have an incentive as a patent applicant to try and be as quickly as possible through the prosecution phase. On the other hand, you also have an incentive to get the broadest patent possible. So again, there are sort of dueling uh, goals here. You want to be both quick and yet accurate and broad um, if, you're a, if you're a patent applicant. Um, and then 20 years after you file, the patent expires. So the prosecution phase is an ex parte administrative process. Um, it's private, um, uh, usually for the first 18 months anyway. After 18 months, things are uh, ap all patent applications are published in most cases. Um, the procedures allow for continuing applications. We think around 75% of all applications eventually result in some patent. Um, uh, that's probably a little high now. More recent studies have shown it's probably somewhere around 50 to 70%. But in any event, most patent applications ultimately result in some sort of uh, patent, in part because even if the patent office rejects your um, initial efforts, you can continue to go back, right? You can continue to pay another fee, refile, continuing applications allow you the, uh, the possibility of uh, continuing the, the effort to get something patented. If you don't like the result uh, that the examiner gives you, there's a two-stage appeal process. There's the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences, um, and you can, uh, otherwise known as the Board, uh, and you can also go to the Federal Circuit. Um, there's also a route you can go to the district courts, but if you don't like what the PTO has decided, you can appeal it. Um, and there's also re-examination um, processes that we'll uh, talk briefly about later. Some of that's changed recently. Um, but there's the possibility for essentially do-overs um, uh, built into the system. The enforcement phase is, is federal court litigation. Uh, uh, like copyrights, a solely federal law, sole federal jurisdiction. Um, courts are empowered, as I noted earlier, to review the validity of patents, um, but these are reviewed with a presumption of validity. So you have to prove um, that there's a uh, that the patents are invalid. Um, declaratory judgment actions, which are lawsuits in reverse, are actually very common in the patent context, um, in part because of the stakes involved for patent infringement. It's very typical um, that somebody before for example, uh, rolling on a new product line or developing a new factory will want to clarify the rights involved in a patent. And because you can argue that a patent is invalid, um, it might make sense if you are a potential patent infringer um, to litigate and maybe try and get that patent declared invalid or at least that you don't infringe it prior to investing uh, any resources in a new technology. So uh, DJ actions are actually quite common in the patent context. 
Um, we think that about 1%, maybe a little less than 1% of all patents are litigated. Um, most people who've looked at this estimate that less than 5% of all patents are licensed, right? So think about that for a minute. That means that, you know, 95% of patents are never litigated, never licensed, right? Um, which is interesting. Uh, so, but that means that the average expected value of patents is probably less than zero, right? Uh, litigation is costly. Of course, getting a patent is costly, somewhere between ten and thirty thousand uh, dollars to obtain a patent, depending on the complexity of the patent and exactly who you hire. Um, that's what it's going to cost. So, if ninety-five percent of them uh, are not used by used, I mean licensed or litigated, then that suggests um, that the distribution of patent value is very heavily skewed, right? So, as far as we can understand. There's a very small number of patents that have very, very high value, and most patents have essentially no value, or if you factor in the cost of obtaining them, they actually have negative value. So that's the uh, one of the puzzles about the patent system. Is it why uh, are so many people getting patents more every year, uh, and yet they seem like they're not particularly valuable, at least in their individual state. Right? One theory is that they are valuable, but in the aggregate, and therefore that's what companies are doing. Right? Here's patenting activity over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, uh, the orange line is, is pending, uh, the green line is granted, and the red is the applications filed. Right? You can see that for most of this time period, the number of patent applications filed has outpaced the number of patents issued, which has resulted in this explosion of pending applications. Right? Only in the last few years has the Patent Office managed to restrain the growth of pending applications. Um, they really haven't made much of a dent at all in reducing the number of pending applications. Um, this is obviously a major policy problem, not only just for the administrative body of the PTO, but also, frankly, for everybody involved, right? Pending pat patent applications are no good. They're delaying um, the ability for people to enforce their rights. Um, they are making it uncertain for people who are uh, competitors of the potential patentees because they don't know what those patents are actually going to cover yet. Um, uh, it creates a, a significant political problem, obviously, for the PTO where people complain to their Congress people and so forth that the patents uh, system is not uh, operating very well. And so this has been a major initiative over the last four years. And although they've managed to sort of stop the growth of uh, pending patent applications, um, they at least so far have not dropped it very much. Moving on to patent theory. So what does a patent do? So we typically think of patents in terms of incentives, right? Like other aspects of intellectual property, the basic story here is the same. Um, we want more of something. Here we want more invention, and therefore we are incentivizing, creating a set of incentives for people to create more of it. It's important to understand that the patent system can actually be said to have several types of incentives, right? One is, of course, the incentive to invent, right? How do you get a patent? You get it by inventing. Therefore, there's an incentive to invent built into the patent system. But you also, because of the patent system, have an incentive to disclose, right? Because you can't get a patent without disclosing uh, your invention to the patent office and ultimately to the world once your patent uh, issues, uh, you have an incentive to disclose in order to get the patent. Plus, since you're going to disclose anyway through the patent system, you have a, an incentive to disclose through other mechanisms, where, whether it be trade papers or academic work or whatever. Overall, because the patent system requires full and complete disclosure, you have an incentive as a patentee to engage in that disclosure. There's an incentive to commercialize, right? A patent doesn't make you any money at all unless it's commercially valuable, unless the product which it covers has actual commercial value. So you have an incentive to commercialize it, either yourself, manufacturing it yourself, for example, or getting somebody else to do so and pay you money for that. It also provides incentives to design around. One of the most important incentives of, of a patent is, and we found in, in doing research on this, that over and over again, People will often 
uh, because a patent is sort of in their way for what they want to do, they'll design something else. They'll change the existing design slightly. They'll look at a product that's successful on a mark in the market and they'll change it a little bit. And it's often the second and third generation of products that are actually really successful. Uh, and that incentive to design around is also part of the patent system. And then incentives to invest in, in uh, research and development is important, right? I mean, companies can have some uh, reassurance that their investments in research and development will not go to waste if, for example, the product either never gets made or the uh, company itself goes belly up, right? So imagine a, a venture capitalist, right? You want to invest in a new company. Um, one of the things you might know is that you can get some money out of their innovations by selling the patents later, right? Because patents become independent assets that embody the research and development work. That means you can more directly think about the way that your investment can be cashed in upon later um, and therefore creates more incentives to invest in research and development. Which of these is most important? You know, everyone has their own idea. I think the incentives to disclose and commercialize are particularly important. I think that obviously incentive to invent is a big one, but a lot of people would invent anyway. I think the patent system does help on the margins considerably with incentives to make full disclosures, to try and commercialize as quickly as possible, and to try and invent around or design around other people's uh, patent rights. So the mechanism here, how does it work, right, um, uh, is uh, important, right? It grants a property right. It's a right to exclude others, right? That's an important distinction. It's not a right to use, right? You don't necessarily have the right to use your patent. Um, somebody else may have um, uh, an overlapping right with yours, and you may not get to use it. You do have the right to exclude others, and that way it's like a property right. It's under private control, right, and just like other Parts, uh, parts of property law, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can rent it, you can trade it, you can subdivide it, whatever you want to do, you can do, um, essentially, with a patent that you could do with, with uh, regular pieces of personal property. The mechanism here um, is to understand that um, uh, you know, there's a, if there's no, if there's a purely competitive market, Right? The price at the end of the day, after a while, I'm sure you've seen these graphs before, will uh, equal the marginal cost of producing uh, one extra item of that good. Right? So the price and quantity uh, will be on the two axes, and they'll meet at the equilibrium point uh, along the demand curve, which is the red line here, um, and that'll be uh, where our, our competitive equilibrium exists. So with patents, However, because you have a right to exclude, that means the person who owns the patent has a level of pricing power, right? What they'll be able to do is raise the price, right, which raises it above the marginal cost of producing the good. This will reduce the price, of course, but what it will also do, right, it gives more reward to the patentees, but it imposes important costs on society. Right? You can see by the fact that that orange line went further to the left. That means less quantity of the good is produced. Right? So that means there's people who would like to buy the product. Think about this as, as, a, as a drug, for example. People would like to be on the new drug, but they can't afford it because the price is now higher because the patentee has pricing power. So that's a cost. That's a loss to society. Right? So the idea here is that we think that overall, that although there's deadweight loss right, and other related types of costs to having this type of system, to having this non-competitive equilibrium, it's nonetheless offset by the incentives that are created. We're going to get more um, of drugs, uh, more investment in drugs, and therefore the fact that people have to pay more and less people have access to them will um, uh, be overcome in the end by having more of the drugs. Right? I do want to be clear here at this point that the patents do not equal monopolies. Right? In most cases, patents don't equal 
monopolies. So although we, you will often see and hear people talk about patents as monopolies, they, they almost are never economic monopolies. There's almost always something that competes with a patent, um, with a patented product, right? Uh, you know, the iPhone is heavily patented, but it has nowhere near a monopoly um, in, in its market. Um, and it's, it's obviously, so just because you have a patent doesn't mean you have a monopoly. So the quantity of the reward, how much money you make from your patent depends on, you know, how close the substitutes are, how strong your patent is, what the market is for uh, that you happen to be operating in and so forth, right? There's obviously other possible mechanisms, uh, for, um, uh, you know, creating the incentives that we get out of the patent system. We'll talk about those in a minute. But there's also important costs, right? So the monopolization costs we already talked about, right? There's going to be dead weight loss uh, related to having these higher prices. Uh, you're also going to have potential rent-seeking behavior. What we mean by that is that if you offer incentives for people to get more money um, by uh, inventing things, they will engage in invention even when maybe they shouldn't. Right? They'll be doing things primarily to try to gain patents rather than to really do things good for society, and that's a potential cost. Um, it might they might restrict future innovation. If I have a patent on um, you know generation one of the iPhone, have I restricted in some way future uh, abilities for other companies to create versions two, three, and four uh, of the iPhone? This is a potential problem with patents as well. There are other options, obviously, rather than just patenting. You could subsidize invention or innovation directly. Right? You could, uh, the two most popular ways to do this would be to offer government uh, sponsorship or cash rewards. Both of these we already do in some cases, especially government sponsorship. The government does fund enormous amounts of research um, uh, in, in that it, are, it is in the subject area of patents. Um, and you know the question is whether these create the same incentives or less of the cost. And and there's no you know easy answer to that. And obviously you could do an entire course just on the economics of uh, patents versus other incentive structures. But uh, for now, let's just uh, assume that 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 we are we think we think we're not sure, uh, but we think that the patent system on balance provides the best mix of strong incentives, um, decentralized decision making, um, fairly cost effective, although it's obviously quite costly, uh, and, um, and protection of invention that, that creates the, all the incentives that we want. Um, and uh, so that's that's where we are. So we, we primarily use the patent system to uh, encourage innovation in this country. So let's talk quickly about patent prosecution. So there's a long list. Well, long depends on your view, but there is a list of the standards for patentability. Um, and the patent office, patent prosecution phase, is primarily tasked uh, with that, but it's important to understand that the validity of patents is tested in two phases. First is during the prosecution phase and then later during the enforcement phase. Right? So patent validity is always at issue and in fact it's probably the most important defense to patent infringement is that the patent is invalid. It doesn't meet the standard for patentability. So during the prosecution phase when you file a patent application, it gets assigned, it gets classified by technology, as we talked earlier, and then it gets assigned to an examiner in a particular what they call art units, which are areas of organization within the patent office organized by technology. The examiner will review your case. On average, uh, examiners are taking 20 to 30 hours these days to review each patent application. The examiner will conduct a search uh, to determine whether there's prior art that, that is relevant to the subject matter. Um, and we'll talk uh, in later classes about exactly what the standards are for whether prior art is invalidating or not. But they're going to do a search for related information. They're going to review the specification and other materials that the patent applicant has filed to make sure the disclosure requirements, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, are satisfied. 
um, they're going to uh, be sure that the patent complies, the patent application complies with a number of other formal aspects. But basically, it's going to they're going it's going the examiner is going to review all of the aspects of validity. During the enforcement phase, once the patent is granted, right, a judge and sometimes a jury will be uh, reviewing the same thing. All of these validity issues are still live at the time. Now, the difference is that once a patent is issued, there's a presumption of validity. What that means is that in order to find a patent invalid, you have to show by clear and convincing evidence the invalidity. Right? So this is a higher standard than the preponderance of evidence. An invalidity determination is final, right? So once your patent is declared invalid, you can never get it back, right? Um, it is, is issue preclusive against you, the patentee. However, the reverse is not true. So even if you, so if I sue company A on my patent, they claim my patent is invalid and I win, right? That judgment although it might seem like that judgment is one of patent validity, what that judgment really is, is uh, that my patent is not invalid. What that means, technically, and actually in truth, is that next time I sue company B, they are allowed, and often will, raise validity issues again, often the same validity issues. So uh, defendants to patent infringement are not precluded by earlier findings of um, no invalidity, uh, but the uh, patentees, once if you lose on validity, you no longer have a patent that you can enforce. Patent prosecution, as we noted earlier, is ex parte. It's just you and the examiner. Uh, applications are private for the first 18 months. Uh, you can have the continuation applications. Um, important is to understand that there are internal incentives of the, of the patent office uh, to issue patents as quickly as possible. They want to be accurate, of course, um, but there are also very strong incentives to issue patents quickly. Uh, for many years, uh, although it's gotten somewhat reformed recently, uh, for many years one of the primary ways that examiners were evaluated on their job performance was via a system that rewarded them uh, for issuing patent applications quickly, uh, which as you might imagine re resulted in strong incentives to issue patent applications quickly. Um, so, and more generally the patent office as we noted earlier has this very very large patent uh, backlog uh, and what would be the easiest way to get rid of the backlog? Why well, simply uh, issue all those patents and and that's something that's a you know a, of concern because obviously you don't want patents out there that have been granted that don't meet the standards of validity because even though during the enforcement phase you can review the standards of validity, federal litigation is very expensive very costly, very time consuming, and with the presumption of validity it's often quite difficult to invalidate a patent in a court case. And again the, the appeal uh, process, you can appeal inside the PTO if you don't like the examiner's decision and there's an external appeal if you don't like the, the, the first stage of appeal. Uh, and re-examination, re reissue, these are essentially ways that you can correct errors, uh, get do-overs um, at the patent office. There's also a post-grant review system that we won't talk about much in this class that's an important new feature um, that, that has just started up in the last couple years and we'll have to see how much impact it has. So now let's move on to the substantive requirements for patentability and the first one that we want to talk about is enablement. Right, so here's the list of uh, standards for patentability. To be valid, a patent must be fully described, that's section 112. In compliance with statutory bars, that's section 102. Novel, section 102. Non-obvious, section 103. Has to be the work of the inventors listed, section 116. Useful, section 101. And within the appropriate subject matter, also section 101. What we're going to be talking about right now is this first one. Right, this first one, which is you have to fully describe your patent in order to uh, uh, inscribe your invention in order to get a patent. 
This comes from uh, 35 U.S.C. Section 112 specification, which says the specification shall contain a written description and of the manner and process and of making and using uh, it in such full, clear, concise, and exact terms as to enable any person skilled in the art to which it pertains or with which it is most nearly connected to make and use the same. Right? So this is the enablement requirement. Right, right here. This is the enablement requirement. You must enable your patent, uh, your invention, in order to get a patent. Right. What does enablement mean? You must describe the manner and process of making and using it in a way that uh, any person skilled in the art to which it pertains or with which it is most nearly connected can make and use it. So the incandescent lamp patent uh, case is an important one. The, the first question here is, what did Sawyer and Mann claim? What is their claim here? And is there something about the language itself that is inherently flawed, or is the problem more specific? So the technology here is, of course, the bulbs, right? Bulbs, uh, electric bulbs, uh, until just very recently, when incandescent bulbs have largely uh, been forced off the market, um, really have not changed very much. The basic idea is you ran electricity through a small filament. That filament would um, uh, generate heat and light, uh, and therefore the bulb would light. Right? The, the, the trick in the Sawyer and Manhattan was exactly what filament was the right one to use to maximize efficiency. Uh, and so Sawyer and Mann claim, their claim, is an incandescent conductor for an electric lamp of carbonized fibrous or textile material and of an arch or horseshoe shape substantially as here and for set forth. The combination uh, is claim two of an electric circuit and a carbonized fibrous material. Um, and then claim three is uh, the incandescent conductor formed of carbonized paper. Right? So the, the question to ask yourself is, what did they claim? And then the next question is, what do they describe? Right? Because this is what we're asking with respect to the enablement requirement. Right? So the enablement requirement requires that you can't get a patent for anything that you don't enable, that you don't describe. Right? And so what was the problem with the Sawyer and Mann description? Well, so how do we figure that out? We look, we take the claim, once we've figured out what they're claiming, and we look back into the patent specification and with the patent disclosure. What you'll find in the patent disclosure is some of the drawings. You'll see that on the, on the left here. And on the right, they describe it. They say, in the practice of our invention, we've made use of carbonized paper and wood carbon. We've also used other such conductors uh, and burners of various shapes. Right? No special description of making the carbon conductors is thought necessary uh, to the ordinary methods and so forth. Right? So what do they actually disclose in terms of their claim? Right? Their claim is carbonized, fibrous, or textile material. What do they actually enable? Well, all they say is it's carbonized paper and wood carbon, right? So carbonized paper and wood carbon is a class, it's a version of carbonized fibrous and textile material, but that does not encompass everything, right? And, and so they've also, they also say in their description they've used other conductors, right? So even though, right, that they may have been the first to come up with this idea of using carbonized paper as the material or that it's a carbonized fibrous material, they can't patent it even if they were the first to come up with it unless they can tell us what it is that they're actually inventing. And the only thing that they've described in their patent, ap patent description is carbonized paper. Right? And what the court says, well, if they could tell us that carbonized paper and the other materials they found worked well had a common principle, if they had uh, invented a common principle that made certain types of material work and certain types of material not work, then their claim works because then a person of skill in the art 
who is reading the patent would understand what types of material would work and what types of material wouldn't. So that's the issue here with enablement, right? The issue with enablement is that you can you can only claim that to which a person of skill in the art can understand uh, how to make and use it, right? Now, and so in Sawyer and Mann failed because they claimed carbonized fibrous and textile material but all they enabled was carbonized paper. Right? And could they have enabled carbonized paper? Probably not because or carbonized fibrous and textile material? Probably not because they also described how certain types of fibrous and textile material didn't work very well. So unless they were able to describe exactly what the common principle was, they're not going to be able to get that disclosure. All right, so let's think about the policy quickly, right? Enablement is, in some sense, at the core of the patent bargain. We say that people don't get to um, get a patent unless they fully disclose. And it's the enablement requirement that really enforces that, right? In order to get a patent, you must tell us what your invention is, right? And you can't just vaguely tell us. You have to tell us how to make and use it, right? You have to tell us in sufficient detail that people can be enabled by your patent. Uh, description, right? And you might say there's two purposes of the, the patent uh, and the enablement requirement as well, right? One is the one that, that comes immediately in mind, which is to force disclosure. The other thing, and this is part of what we see in the Sawyer and Mann case, in the incandescent um, uh, light patent case, is that it, the enablement requirement restrains the scope of the claims as well. It limits how broadly you can draft your claims because you can only draft claims as broadly as you can describe. Is, and so it keeps claims from getting too broad. Right? How do we evaluate this? By the FOSITA. Right? This you're going to hear about a lot in the patent context. Person having ordinary skill in the art. Who is this? This is like the reasonable man in, in, in uh, tort law, right? This is an imaginary person who is of ordinary skill in the art. Do you have to describe everything about your invention? No, you don't have to describe everything. What you have to describe is what a person of ordinary skill in the art would need to know in order to create your invention. How do you prove your case? Well, you provide uh, information uh, and, uh, you know, in litigation, this is a battle of the experts, right? You're going to have a technical expert on one side saying this is enabled, right? That a person of skill in the art at the time would understand uh, what Sawyer and Mann were saying. You're going to have a battle of the ex uh, expert on the other side who's going to say, well, a person at the time knowing what an ordinary, uh, having ordinary skill would not understand what Sawyer and Mann were inventing. And so that's the debate in enablement. Now that we've covered enablement, let's move to the written description requirement. So the written description requirement is in the same section of 112, in the same part of 112, same paragraph. Right? And what it says is, is it's much shorter than the uh, enablement requirement. It simply says that the specification shall contain a written description of the invention. Right? So first of all, one thing to ask is, is this different than enablement? Right? Is this really a different and separate requirement from enablement? Because right? you can read the paragraph of 112 as saying the specification shall contain a written description of the invention and of the manner and process of making using it in such full, clear, and concise terms and so forth. You can read it as saying this is all one requirement known as enablement. Right? And that the, the, what the first language there is is that it's got to be written. And in fact, that was the interpretation um, for uh, the way that the statute worked until uh, the Gentry Gallery case in 1998. And the technology in the Gentry Gallery case was a uh, recliner sofa. Uh, many of you listening are probably uh, persons of ordinary skill in the art of uh, recliners and sofas. Um, so you'll know this technology well. Uh, the basic idea here uh, was a set of, of uh, sectional recliner sofas that had controls. And the claims uh, were to a recliner sofa with controls that could be located anywhere. Right? You can put the, rec 
controls on the side, on the on the in inside, alongside the cushion, and so forth. The disclosure, however, was basically just the picture. And the disclosure, if you track out the numbers uh, of the diagram, shows that the uh, controls are only available on the console itself. Right? So there's no disclosure beyond the console of where these controls might be placed, even though they could obviously be placed a variety of other locations. So the issue here was whether or not this claim is nonetheless valid. Right? So the 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 court says here the original disclosure clearly uh, identifies the console as the only possible location for the controls, only the most minor vi variations, and noting the control may be mounted on the top or side surfaces of the console without departing from the invention. Accordingly, when viewed in its entirety, the disclosure is limited to sofas in which the recliner control is located on the console. So Berkline argues that this patent claim, uh, the claim that says controls anywhere, is invalid. Right? And so the first question is why is this not an enablement case? Well it's not an enablement case because a person of skill in the art uh, of designing and creating recliner sofas would obviously understand that you could move the controls to a variety of locations. So there really wasn't a serious enablement challenge because persons of skill in the art would understand this. The question is whether or not it's nonetheless invalid. And the court in Gentry Gallery, in a fairly surprising decision to everybody, said that yes, it's invalid under the written description requirement. That because the patentee had specified in the description that the only location for the controls was on the console itself, that then there was no ability uh, and no uh, possibility for them to claim beyond that. And then any claims that were directed beyond controls on the console were therefore invalid. So this was obviously a, a major um, uh, decision because it suggested for the first time uh, in the modern era that the written description requirement was really distinct and independent from the enablement requirement and that's obviously a big deal. Um, it also offers a number of suggestions about strategic claim drafting or strategic uh, patent drafting. Right? One thing it suggests is to make sure that you disclose more broadly and more vaguely, more importantly. Um, uh, because if you look at what the court decided, it's, it wasn't so much the lack of disclosure as much as the very clear language that the patentee used about where the console, where the controls could be. Um, if the controls, if the uh, disclosure was merely an example rather than the way that the patentee described it as the only place for the controls, then the case might have turned out differently. But it certainly suggests that when you're thinking about patent drafting, you need to make sure you've thought through all of these questions about whether or not your claims can be uh, not only enabled but also fully described. So Gentry Gallery raised a number of important questions about what is going on with respect to the doctrine in this area. Right? One is what is the difference between the written description and the enablement requirement? Right? Um, and in particular, what's the purpose of having this separate requirement? If you think of the disclosure requirements as trying to enforce the quid pro quo between the patentee and society by forcing disclosure, um, then is the written description requirement doing anything more than the enablement requirement? If it's not doing anything more, then it may not be worth having. Right? The, the doctrine Right? The case law says that the written description requirement is a, is a way of proving that the patentee, quote, possessed the invention at the time of filing. Right? The idea, I guess, um, is here that the patentee at the time of filing needs to be able to show that he or she um, uh, had, f had a full idea of the invention in the claims by describing it in full terms. 
Now, you might ask, does an enablement do that, right? If I have described everything I need enough sufficient for one of skill in the art to understand the scope of my claims, haven't I shown that I possessed it? Um, which I think is a fair point, but the courts believe that there's a difference there, that there's a difference between possessing it and merely enabling it, right? Now, where would this be useful, right? It's not entirely clear, but it does seem like this court, this area um, has more impact in uh, areas of chemistry uh, and biology, right? And that's because it seems like when you are less certain about the uh, technology area, meaning the, the avenues of science are somewhat less clear, so we're not exactly sure exactly how chemical reactions work in some cases. Biology and in, in some of the advanced biology is still a relatively uncertain field. In these areas, written description is going to be more of a problem because the court, by saying you need to show possession of the invention, means you're going to have to disclose more details about exactly how your invention works than you might otherwise have to. And that's going to have differential effects in different kinds of technologies. Now, you can argue this may be a good thing, right? It may be in these uncertain areas of technology we want to restrict patenting somewhat, right? We want to actually draw back and not let people claim very broadly, right? On the other hand, you might argue that, that doing so is going to diminish the incentives in the very areas in which you need maximum incentives, that is, uncertain new technologies. So that's a policy debate, one that, quite honestly, the courts have really just not engaged in at all. The Federal Circuit has just decided that it thinks there's a separate and independent written description requirement, that it requires possession of the invention, and this has been very controversial. Right? The most recent major statement on this is the Ariad case. Right? The Ariad case involves relatively complicated technology. Don't worry too much if you don't understand the technology. You really don't have to to understand what's going on here. Right? The claims were to methods involving the reduction of activity between certain um, uh, biological recognition sites, uh, molecular recognition sites. It wasn't limited. The claims did not limit themselves to particular substances or particular molecules. Right? The disclosure is, has a number of hypotheses about the kinds of molecules that might reduce this activity. Right? They say decoy molecules, dominantly interfering molecules, and specific inhibitor molecules might all operate um, in the way that the claims describe. Right? So the first question is whether this is enablement. And one of the odd things about the Ariad case is the court doesn't discuss enablement. Right? The majority doesn't. Judge Lynn has a dissent saying that enablement should have been um, uh, dealt with. That's actually not, I don't think, in this version of the casebook. Um, uh, and Judge Lynn says, you know, we haven't addressed this because the claims written broadly enough to cover any method achieving a particular result, it may be that such a claim can never be valid because you can't un enable unknown methods. Right? The idea here is that if all you're saying is that you have a method that, in, that reduces activity and then you hypothesize about how you might do that. What Judge Lynn is saying, that doesn't sound like enablement. It sounds like a hypothesis, right? Not a teaching. And although you might argue that a, that a person of skill in the art could try different things and eventually figure it out, on the other hand, that might be um, insufficient for the enablement requirement, and Judge Lynn's argument is that at the very least we should use enablement, right? And he says this is an important issue that we have left unresolved. It's an issue that we would have been compelled to reach had the case been decided on enablement grounds, a basis found in Section 112 instead of written description grounds, a separate basis not justified under that section or any other provision of the Patent Act, right? So Judge Lynn's point is why are we pretending that there's this separate component of section 112 called the written description requirement when we don't need to. We can just use the enablement requirement and get to the same result if we wanted and indeed he doesn't even think there should be an independent written description requirement. So the court nonetheless doesn't address enablement so 
presume, I guess, that it thought it was enabled, right? And the question is whether it is, uh, uh, whether the written description requirement has been met here, whether it's sufficient, it shows sufficient possession of the invention uh, by the patentee. And what the court says here with respect to how to characterize the written description requirement is the following. The test for sufficiency is whether the disclosure of the application relied upon reasonably conveys to those skilled in the art that the inventor had possession of the claimed subject matter as of the filing date. The specification must describe an invention understandable to that skilled artisan and show that the inventor actually invented the invention claimed. And while the description requirement does not demand any particular form of disclosure or that the specification recite the claimed invention, a description that merely renders the invention obvious does not satisfy the requirement. All right, so this is not particularly helpful language in terms of figuring out what the test is because it just says that the inventor actually invented and had possession. What does that mean? How much disclosure? here do we need? How, how do we evaluate this set of claims? Does the fact that you can hypothesize the three different types of molecules that would operate in this manner, does that mean you've invented the method? Or does that mean and you possess it? Or does it mean that you have not? Right? I don't think that test that they've described here tells you much about it. And they go on then. Right? to say, look, we understand that the term possession of the invention has never been very enlightening. Right? It, require, it implies that as long as one can produce records documenting a written description of the claimed invention, one can show possession. But the hallmark of written description is disclosure. This possession as shown in the disclosure is more complete query whether this is any more useful. Yet whatever the specific articulation, the test requires an objective inquiry into the four corners of the specification. Based on that inquiry, the specification must describe an invention understandable to that skilled artisan and show that the inventor actually invented the invention claimed. Right? This is, this is the latest word. This is the Ariad case. This is the test for written description. Right? So, you know, a few questions here. Is a requirement that the inventor prove possession of her invention actually useful? So what are we getting out of this component of the test? Right? Obviously, by requiring enablement, we're forcing disclosure. We're making sure that patent documents actually teach the invention, that they tell people what the invention is all about, that they are um, uh, descriptive enough for people to, to do what they're supposed to be doing with respect to disclosure. What are we getting out of the proved possession uh, articulation of the written description requirement? I mean, you can argue that perhaps what we're trying to do here is use this requirement to restrain overclaiming, right? That maybe what we're trying to do with the written description requirement is to keep people from claiming broadly, even though they can teach people the full scope of the claim, Right, that maybe we still want to say to people that unless you have thought through all of the specific details, even if you could, in theory, tell us the details, if you don't tell us the details about what your invention is, you don't get to make that claim. Right? And so maybe in that sense, it's useful in the sense uh, that it restricts uh, claiming uh, and keeps people close to what they're actually thinking about at the time of invention. Now, the downside is that the test that the courts have articulated is so vague and unpredictable as to be almost useless. So it's very difficult to advise clients on whether their invention is going to fail or pass the written description requirement. The only thing, like I said, that we do know is that this is more susceptible to having an impact in uh, particular technology areas such as chemistry and bio, uncertain areas. How will it impact patenting behavior? People are going to disclose more, probably. Patent applications are going to get longer. Whether that's more useful or not is not clear. People might be putting in many, many more examples uh, of how their invention could be used so that they can claim more broadly and then encompass all of those examples. Um, it's not clear to me whether this written description requirement is indeed 
reading the statute really a separate requirement or if it's all that useful above and beyond enablement but it is what it is and and Ariad is the latest case on it uh, and so that establishes um, the current test which is in order to pass the written description requirement you have to show possession of the invention what possession means is what the court says is you look at the patent document and you determine whether a person of skill in the art would understand that the inventor actually invented the invention and so that's enablement and written description and indeed the disclosure requirements for patent law and I will talk to you next time.